Few people in recent years have done more to popularize space and science and astrophysics and the big questions of what's happening in the world around us. Then Neil deGrasse Tyson, the famous American astrophysicist, familiar face to many of us. We've seen him on his TV shows. We've seen him uh, talking at great length about science. He has pretty much become the face of science for all of us. If you want to get your kids to get really interested in science and technology, get them to start listening and watching Neil deGrasse Tyson. So Neil, thank you so much for joining us. It's such a pleasure that you could join us on, on this world. Hey, I know, I, I know you like controversy, so let me dive straight into it. Many people would argue that our exploration of space has been somewhat disappointing in the last 40 to 50 years. We reached the moon in 1969, that's what, more than 50 years ago. And then after that, things seem to have slowed down. Uh, we've even stopped going back to the moon. We haven't gone to Mars. We haven't gone to Jupiter or Saturn. Uh, we haven't tried to find out whether there's life on Europa or water on Europa. We've done none of that. Uh, why do we seem to have lost interest in space to some extent? So you, you've mischaracterized it a little bit. So let me just tidy up what you just said. We have not lost interest in space. Right now, we have an SUV-sized rover that was plunked down on the surface of Mars that's getting data as we speak. And, 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 and since then, India has an orbiter around Mars right now. Nobody was orbiting Mars in the 1960s. We've sent missions to fly by Pluto. We've sent a mission to Saturn that had a daughter probe that landed on a moon of Saturn, the first time we've ever landed on the moon of another planet. Sure, Neil, I, I, I hear you, but and there is stuff that is being done, but compare that to what you were reading about or seeing when, when you were a kid growing up, the movies that were being made in 1960s, Arthur C. Clarke saying 2001, this is going to happen, bases all over the solar system, 2010, this would happen. Compared to what the expectations may have been 40 to 50 years ago, I'm we don't seem there. to be there yet, not when it comes to space. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. I'm just saying it, we are the victim of our own success in robotics. Okay? I can send a rover to Mars that is fully equipped as a scientific laboratory, which if I sent a person, I'd have to send the laboratory with you and you push the same button that I can do remotely. Okay, so in terms of exploration and this, we, we have a telescope sitting a million miles from Earth observing the beginning of the universe. No, we have not lost interest in space. Let me start there. Now get to your more specific point. How come we haven't sent people into space? Oh, that's different. Let me tell you why we send people into space in the first place. It was because we Americans were scared of the Soviet Union, and they were gaining the high ground in space. They had the first satellite, Sputnik. They had the first mammal, which was the dog. They had the first human. They had the first woman. They had the first black person, who was a Cuban, a dark-skinned Cuban, and they were part of the communist community. They were beating us at everything. And we said, we got to do something. What are we going to do to show the world that we're better than they are? So we said, let's go to the moon. So we aligned resources as never before. That we today it's now metaphor. Moon, what's your moonshot today for a big, expensive, hairy, audacious project? So we go to the moon, we get there, and we find out, oh, Russia's not the, planning to go to the moon. We're done. We, we could have stayed on the moon, but we didn't because we there was no longer the Russia threat. Period. Okay. Right. So, so. People in space, you need a reason to do it. And generally, it's geopolitical, not scientific, because of the expense that it involves. So All the why... other missions that I described to you were scientific, and their expense was below a radar level of spending that sits below the cost of sending people. Fair enough. I guess funding is always a problem. And it's interesting that one of the one of the ways that people have been going to space in the last few years, and some interest is, is returning, is almost as some sort of a tourist expedition. You know, all those rockets that are going up, whether it is Bezos or, or anybody else. Um, but just pure exploration as a tourist yes. venture can be dangerous, as we did see in the in the case of that submarine that went down to try and find the Titanic and it collapsed. So um, 
I'm not sure basing the entire concept of space exploration on tourism is that necessarily the best way forward or sustainable. Okay, so that's not how it works. You think that's how it works, but that's not how it works. The year the greatest number of people ever died climbing Mount Everest, okay? The year after that had the most applications to climb the mountain as ever before, the most. The year we lost the Challenger astronauts in that disaster, the year after that, the budget for space exploration went up, okay? The fact that people die doing something brave or audacious has never historically prevented further interest, and often it has redoubled it. So that's my first point. Second point, yes, the tourists, that's different. And the reason why it's different is it's private money that's doing it. It's not your tax money. Somebody is paying the bill. Fine. If, if space tourism, which uh, Prime Minister Modi also considered when he's talking about commercializing space, fine. Let them do it. But they're not going to the moon because that's too expensive. They're going in Earth orbit or even less, you know, up and down. Uh, the, the Branson Bezos, that's up and down. Elon Musk is going in full orbit. Um, and that's for rich people, yes. But I, even if you can't bring the price down, here's what you do. You hold a lottery. You hold a lottery. You get 50 million people to buy, spend $1 on a lottery ticket, and then two of them go into space. That'd be fun. Do that every time. If it still right. remains expensive, you give access to people who can't otherwise afford it. And so, anyhow, so uh, so right now, NASA is returning to the moon. And, of course, Mars, Elon Musk has his sights on Mars. But I don't see us going to Mars without a geopolitical force behind it. I guess the other thing related to space, uh, which does get a lot of interest and is happening in the U.S. also, is the question of aliens, or more specifically, the search for life, that big question, are we alone in this universe? Is that perhaps one of the biggest unanswered questions of all time? And is that the actual thing that could actually capture public attention once again in all questions around science and space? By the way, I don't think the question has to even be that big to attract public interest in space. The public is interested in solar eclipses. The public is interested in rocket launches. The public is interested in black holes. And there's a lot of lesser things the public can be completely excited about in this universe. But that being said, you are correct. The search for life in the universe is one of the greatest quests of all time. How would but you so do too, it better? Well, NASA, well, we have programs in the search for um, SETI, so the search for intelligent life in the universe. We have other people looking for any kind of life at all bacterial, whatever, there, there's a way to search the atmospheres of exoplanets to see if it has been influenced by the chemistry of life on the surface. And so that's an entire cottage industry in my field of people investigating. So uh, our expectation that there's life elsewhere in the universe is very high for a series of very well-reasoned arguments for why that might be the case. So let me come to one thing that has been getting a lot of attention, especially after the whistleblower, David Grush, has claimed that the American government has had alien craft for a very long time and that they've been studying this entire phenomenon. What do you make of this renewed interest once again in the UFO phenomenon? Uh, UFOs have always been interesting. Uh, we had Project Blue Book back in the night. There was an Air Force project back in the 1960s, and that published a report early 1970s. They might still have it on my shelf. Um, the study of unidentified objects, you kind of want the military to be on top of that situation because it might harm us. Is it a foreign enemy? Is it or, or are they aliens? Sure. Uh, go go investigate it. There should be some money allocated to to what's going on in the sky especially if you don't understand it. No problem there. The I would ask questions. For example, if we've been visited by aliens, why did they only visit government agencies? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? Why? Why? Really? Really? Uh, do you realize a million people are airborne at any given moment because of, on, on, on jetliners? And, every, it's, and there's six billion smartphones in the world? We, if there was an alien invasion, I think it would be 
nicely crowdsourced with high definition, high resolution images and video of that happening. Oh, but no, they only visited government agencies. Yeah, but for decades, you've had people saying, oh, we've seen UFOs. You've had people saying that they've been abducted by aliens. You've been hearing all sorts of other conspiracy theories. I, like, I would yeah. say the, the alien abducted people, those that's an, a bygone era. That's from the 60s and 70s. Now yeah. that everyone has a camera, we don't have any images of anybody getting abducted. So that, that went away. There was another one where we saw flying saucers off the side of roads. That ended when car companies stopped making hubcaps on the wheels. <laughs> Okay, because you, you would go over a, a, a bump in the road and the hubcaps, there was always some hubcap on the side of the road. You can fling it, take a picture, look just like a flying saucer. Those photos have gone away, for example. So I, I just need better evidence than someone's testimony. Uh, people like Bob Lazar saying that they are isotopes that only an alien could have. Yeah, I'd like to see some alien technology. That'd be fun, which is aliens himself. That would be even better. And... Plus, to really think the government is that good at keeping secrets? Really? <laughs> I don't think they are. <laughs> they can keep a secret that no one cares about. There's an old saying, was it Benjamin Franklin, one of the old old, old folks from early United States that said, I think it's three. Three people can keep a secret if two of them are dead. <laughs> so... <laughs> All right. Now, one of the things that is actually happening and concretely around us is the world of AI. Now, I know you've done some absolutely fantastic work in interpreting cinema and analyzing cinema from the point of view of, you know, is it accurate or is it, uh, is it not accurate? Are we deviating from, from the truth is. Now, when it comes to AI, are we starting to approach the world of science fiction? You know, all those scary stories about HAL and Skynet and Ex Machina and all of that. Is that what uh, we could be heading to, that sort of a future when it comes to AI? Uh, AI has been with us for decades. So it's a matter of where they keep moving the goalposts to say, when you first used Siri on a smartphone, you say, that's AI. Oh, my gosh. What, what am I going to do? Am I going to run for the hill? No, you ask Siri, what's the shortest way to grandma's house? But but factor in the traffic. This is a, a, a non-human point of interaction that's making decisions for you. Oh, that's not AI. Okay, so you don't want to call that AI. Well, 30 years ago, people would have freaked out if they had access to that kind of computing. So what happens? Oh, a computer beats the best chess player. Okay, did the civilization end? No. Then it beat the best Go player. That beat in our country. We have this game show called Jeopardy, where you have to know stuff. It beat the best Jeopardy player. Did everyone go running for the hills? No. It's been moving good. Oh, now it can compose your term paper. Okay, it crossed into the realm of the liberal arts. So, why? I didn't lose when, when we started using neural nets to help us reduce data in the universe that was too large and we, we didn't have the time or the energy or the efficiency that an AI module would have doing this. We didn't we didn't we didn't throw up our hands and say that's the end of the world. We said, great, let's invoke it in just the way we need. Right. So chat P, GPT P, uh, it, it's, is going to replace journalism or novel writing or maybe I don't know. It's kind of interesting. OK, but to all of a sudden say this is the beginning of the end of the world now. And you didn't say that 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Uh, it's just going to continue. Right. I see. Yes, there are dangers. Yes, there were dangers when computers came online. There were dangers when computers had launch codes to missiles. Yes. So for every advance, you need a tandem sense of security and controls and a sort of moral fiber to go alongside it. Yes. And we're a little behind on that. We kind of always are. Technology is always leading our ability to govern it. But for right. me, I don't see it as fundamentally different. But but AI experts do. So you should just listen to them and not me. All right, Neil deGrasse Tyson, if you had a crystal ball in front of you and you had to stare into it, uh, would you tell me what do you think are going to be the most exciting four to five things in the world of science in the next 10 years. Excellent. So I, I wrote a book recently called 
Starry Messenger, Cosmic Perspectives on Civilization. And one of the chapters is on exploration and discovery, where I talk about the pace of discovery and how rapid it is. It's basically exponential. And so then I said, look at all the bad predictions people made, because they were making linear predictions, whereas it's the exponential predictions that come true. So, and people are, 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 are prone to think only linearly. So I said, well, let me, if, if I'm embarrassing these other people, let me embarrass myself. So I put in some predictions going forward till the year 2050. So one, and I would delight in the possibility of being embarrassed for being wrong in this. So we can reconvene in 26 years, 26, and you can tell me how wrong I was. I'm not gonna wait for 26 years. If it's okay by you, I'll come back and check with you every year, if you don't mind. Okay, I think in a very short time, self-driving electric cars will completely replace all other cars on the road. Self-driving cars can drive twice as fast as you can. They have instant reflexes, which you don't. Um, and if you want to change lanes, you tell the other cars, I want to change lanes. They will part for you. You change lanes. This is self-driving electric cars. That is the future. It'll save millions of lives. Okay, we lose 40,000 people a year on our highways, in the cars, and getting hit by cars just from car accidents. Th th we can basically take that to near zero in self-driving cars. So I see that, maybe even within 10 years. Um, I see the human genome being, we're so good at it that we isolate certain devastating congenital diseases that so we can cure certain diseases that are scores to humanity. And I can see that as the first of this. And then maybe medicines, uh, drugs that, and this is a special interest to the pharmaceutical industry of India, drugs that will um, are so perfectly tuned to your DNA that there are no side effects at all. Because what are side effects? The things that kind of have to be in there, but your body's reacting badly to it, but you need to, so you, we snip, tuck, figure all that out. There it is. I see quantum computing as a major advance in our capacity to compute, which will open up whole spheres of problems that were forever unreachable with classical computing. One last one. Uh, what was it? I think, no, we're not going to have flying cars. <laughs> Sorry. Everyone wants flying cars because that, that's in all the science fiction movies. Are you going to be on Mars, you think? Uh, maybe a moon colony, but I don't, I don't see a Mars colony. Not that we wouldn't know how to do it. It's, that's not why I'm saying it. It's just that I don't see the motivation for it. I don't see the business model for it. That, that's, uh, if we go, it will not be driven by uh, curiosity or business. There'll be some other geopolitical force operating on that decision. That's what I can see. I, I'm just add one thing. Ready? Uh, in yeah. 10, 20 years, at the rate India is growing its economy and moving people from the from the the poverty into middle class and the rate at which technology is being uptaken, maybe India will be one of the world's leading economies in the next 20 years. It's poised to be so. And if it's not, it's because somewhat people were not making decisions they could have in the interest of the future of the nation. Yeah, but I think that's a fairly safe prediction. India already top five present growth rates will be top three within the next seven years or eight years. So yes, that is a safe a prediction to make. So thank you so much, Neil Grass Rison, for joining us. It was such a pleasure. Look forward to talking thank to you. you frequently. Thank you for thank your you. interest. Okay, bye.